Welcome to Indoctrination, a weekly conversation series about protecting yourself from systems of control. I'm your host, Rachel Bernstein. Hello, everyone. Just a quick reminder, if you want to be able to order a webinar that I put together for former cult members and another one that I put together for the families and friends of those who have been in cults or are still or are in relationships with controllers and you want to know how to be able to be helpful from the outside, then please go to my website at rachelbernsteintherapy.com and order one. And you can also order both. Some people will order them for their loved ones coming out of a controlled and manipulative situation so they understand more about what happened to them and how to move on. And they order one for themselves so that they, again, can be that supportive friend or family member that they would like to be able to be during this time. So go to rachelbernsteintherapy.com and order it there. Today, we have some really special guests. We have Sarah and Jess. And Sarah and Jess are longtime friends who grew up together in Canada. They are ex-Christians who discuss their former faith, one strange topic at a time, on their cleverly named podcast, You Can't Get Into Heaven in a Mini Skirt, which, as we discuss, is a reference to a popular Christian song. Today's episode is actually the second part of a crossover episode with You Can't Get Into Heaven in a Miniskirt, the first part where Sarah and Jessica turn the tables and interview me. It's available now on their podcast feed. Just follow the link in our show notes so you can listen to it. The stated goal of their podcast is to expose the abusive power structures and toxicity within the Christian faith and create a safe place to heal from those affected by religious trauma. Sarah and Jessica say their aim is to bridge the divide of the ever-growing chasm of religious and political ideology in North America. Now that they live on opposite sides of the country, they spend most of their free time researching for the podcast in an effort to find common ground between believers and non-believers. So, here now is my conversation with Sarah and Jessica. I am so happy today to have Sarah and Jessica with me from You Can't Get to Heaven in a Miniskirt podcast. It is such a good show. I've had a chance to listen to some of the episodes and uh, I love how open and honest you are about yourselves. And I love the name of the podcast and the song always like I've heard about the song from other people who grew up singing it. I think there's a lot you can't do, actually, in a miniskirt. You can't get in and out of a car, really, safely. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) And, of course, I'm thinking not going to heaven in a miniskirt. Like, no, I wouldn't want anyone looking up my skirt if I'm assuming heaven is up and you can't walk upstairs. (laughs) It's just everything is hard about it. I never thought of it that way. Right? Because, yes, I'm looking at it from a totally different angle. And I'm sure that's not at all the intention of the song or the title of the podcast. But we will get into that. So tell me, tell me about you. Tell the listeners about you. Let's start with you, Sarah, if you don't mind taking a moment and introducing yourself. So my name is Sarah and Jessica and I have been friends going back to middle school. So like age 12, 13. And I grew up in the Baptist church and was a faithful Sunday school, Pioneer Clubs, youth group attendee. And then the Baptist church was a little too boring for me in my teen years. So I hopped on over to a charismatic church that was affiliated with the New Frontiers movement. I'm not sure if you're familiar with them, but they're that's where we get into the kind of high control, very misogynistic um, group of people where they they basically control every aspect of your life, from wanting you to tithe your student loans to you know women not being able to occupy positions of leadership. They're very very anti anti queer. 
And so I was involved with that church after high school. I took a year off after between post-secondary and high school. And I went and worked in the UK for a year at one of their churches. And I was working like, like 80 hour weeks and only had Mondays off. And that was, it was very, very intense and very eye opening. And then when I came back to Canada, I kind of, as Christians say, backslid and kind of went in and out of that church for the next few years. And then eventually just my worldview after, just after learning about science, evolution, uh, the way that I felt the world worked and the best explanation for why we're here, all the things, I just didn't feel like that was captured within that group or within within any organized religion. So I'm agnostic now. And I left the church officially in like 2011 when I was 21. You know, since then, got married, had a couple kids, came out as gay, got divorced. And so a lot of that was tied in with my experience in the church and not being able to not being able to be who I was and that not being an option. And so that's kind of me in a nutshell right now. Okay, good. Well, it's very nice to have you on the show. And I, and yes, I think the the disorientation of realizing who you are and who you love um, within the context of something that is so structured and so phobic. I mean, it's just, I don't even want to call it homophobic. It's just phobic, just about anything that is not in line with it, with the structure, the, what is sort of seen as the norm even though I've always wondered about that, because if it is a natural variation and if you believe in God and you think God, you know, created human beings uh, in his image or image, whoever's image, and then this is one of God's images. But that's that's me being a heretic. Welcome to the club. (laughs) Right. (laughs) Okay, it's fine. Yeah, it's it's a fun club, actually. I enjoy being in it. Yes. Right. And it's actually filled with some good people who are just saying, I'm sorry, what? (laughs) So uh, thank you for that. And um, and I'm glad that you you've been able to to find and explore who you are and realize it and enjoy it. And um, so that's a wonderful thing. And so for you, Jessica, tell us about you. So I'm Jessica. I am the other host of You Can't Get to Heaven in the Miniskirt podcast. My story is definitely not as intense as Sarah's. I was raised Catholic as a child, but it was like Catholic light. Yeah, we didn't go to church. We went to church most Sundays. I was confirmed into the Catholic church. And then like Sarah, the Catholic church was too boring for me. So when I met Sarah when we were 12, 13, like she said, And she ended up bringing me to the Baptist church, to youth group, and then to a Christian summer camp where we both worked for a few years. And it was kind of at this Christian camp that I started to get more intense into it. And then I started also attending the New Frontiers Church. But I think for me, I ended up leaving the church earlier than Sarah. And my exit was easier because my parents weren't involved in Christianity really in any way. They were, you know, we, they were raised Catholic. So they ended up going to Catholic church and then they kind of stopped. And it was just kind of what you did where we were from. You kind of just go to church. And, and so my exit from the church wasn't quite dramatic. I kind of just stopped going. And I think though, my problems lie in all of the unrealized issues that have come up since I've become an adult and things that I was taught as a teenager for so many years and so many things that I had repressed for so long kind of have come out since. And yeah, that's kind of why we are doing this podcast is as we are in now we're in our 30s and we have children and we realize how, you know, I don't even know what the right word is, insane. (laughs) Some of the things that we were taught. Uh, and there's a lot more to dive in in each aspect. Oh my goodness. Yes, 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 there is. Okay. So I'm curious. Yes, I want to hear more about your story and then I want to hear about the podcast. Um, but can you first talk about the song, You Can't Get to Heaven in a Skirt? If it were not so misogynistic, I think it was clever and cute, right? Because it's a cute title. So just tell us about that and where that title of your podcast comes from. And then we'll go back and talk about your stories. Well, I feel like Jessica, Jessica blocks a lot of things out and then I bring them to the surface. Um, And I just remember most things. Um, So this was a song that 
we would sit around the campfire at Christian camp and sing. And there are some really cute verses. Like you can't get to heaven on roller skates because they'll roll right past heaven's gates. But then this was one that we would, that we would sing. And it like, I didn't ever really question it because I mean, at the time we, it had quite a gendered dress code of what we could wear at the camp. And so, you know, you can, if you, if you stand up and you have your arms at your sides, like a, like a robot, it can't go past, or it has to be like longer than your fingertips. And I still do that. I still, to this day, will bend over and reach my hands above my head to make sure my stomach's not showing for going to work in my thirties. Like, (laughs) It's funny the things that stick with you. So yeah, that was that was the song. And I feel like when we started talking about doing a podcast, that kind of captured everything because it had a lot to do with, okay, the gatekeeping and the power of people telling other people what to do with their bodies and just the misogyny that was within the evangelical church in the ni- in the 90s and the 2000s when we were raised. And the and the purity culture that still affects us today. I think that was when we started the podcast, we really wanted to talk a lot about purity culture. We definitely do. But I think that the topics have been there's just so many topics. We can't talk about purity culture all the time, but it is something that has deeply affected us. And that really encapsulates it, I think. Yeah. And I mean, purity culture is so closely tied with with power structures because it's all to do with like who has the balance of power, who's allowed to make decisions and that's very often in these kinds of groups, not women, not young girls. You don't have the say over what to do with your body and you don't have a voice. So it's a long title, but we couldn't not use it. <laughs> right? No, you couldn't not. Uh, I was actually reading recently about Mary Quant, who invented the miniskirt, or at least popularized it in London. So she was considered this commercially minded, opinionated woman who was married and her husband supported a lot of the things that she did, uh, maybe financially, I'm not sure, but emotionally speaking. And that not only was the skirt that she helped to popularize Mini, but also she named it after her car, the Mini Cooper that she had that was from London. So, but it was considered this liberating thing, like enough with the pantyhose, with the clips, with the being hot and sweaty on, you know, on a hot day, not being able to show anything. And, and the idea that you could show parts of your body and it didn't change your character. It didn't mean something about you. Just like wearing long things doesn't mean something about your character. Uh, Wearing short things doesn't either. And it doesn't mean also then that it translates into what's allowed to be done to you because of it. Like it doesn't mean anything else except that you like that fashion. And I think so much of what people deal with is that stuff is given meaning. And within religious frameworks, things are given a lot of meaning. But I would assume, correct me if I'm wrong, but I would assume in this song, there isn't a lyric about what boys or men should wear or not wear. That would limit them getting into heaven, right? Then I might be okay with it a little bit, but no, it's always the women. But don't you know, Rachel, women don't lust. We don't have the capacity for that. Oh, wait, let me make it. Let me write that down. (laughs) Yeah, just so you know. That's a scientific Uh, fact, not. Yeah, we had to wear t-shirts over our bathing suits, yet the men could just go shirtless. It's Men are visual and women are emotional. Yeah, don't you know? (laughs) Wow. Wow. Right. Because you can talk about all women the same way and all men the same way. It's equally wrong. Thank God for those God-given roles, right? (laughs) Right. Exactly. Exactly right. You know, so if we can also define about purity culture, because I know that some of the listeners know what it is and some might not. So um, which one of you wants to take it away and do a, a definition of that? So purity culture, it's kind of referring to the purity movement, which started in the 1990s, I believe, and it had a lot to do with purity balls and purity rings. So just keeping the virginity of a woman sacred, keeping a woman a virgin until marriage and really valuing that above all other aspects of her character. And I really like, Rachel, that you said that people can wear whatever they want and it doesn't change their character. And that is the total opposite messaging we got. We got a guy is only going to value you for the way you look if you dress slutty. They're not going to want you if you sleep with them or if you give too much of yourself because then there's nothing left to give. I think at the very core purity culture is degrading women to just one small thing and that is their bodies. And their bodies are something to be feared 
you know, men have to, you have to dress in a certain way to protect your Christian brothers from stumbling because the female body is dangerous and men are these ravenous monsters that have no control or accountability for their own actions. Like, and I, along those lines as well, the women's body is something to be feared, but it's also something to be owned. So it's owned first by her father and then it's passed over to the ownership of her husband on her wedding day. And you never have body autonomy as a woman. Your body always belongs to somebody else. These are like really the more extreme denominations of Christianity. But, you know, we just watched the shiny happy people documentary, the Duggar documentary. And, you know, although they are incredibly outspoken about all of this, it really trickles down to, well, every single denomination that I was a part of at least had, maybe it wasn't said outright, but ever, all of that was implied. It was all implied. Like it was all there, maybe not said in the exact same words. So people may think, oh no, our church doesn't do that. But in our experience, many do just in a different way. And, and the effect is the same. The effect is the same. You're right. And, you know, it also, if a woman needs to remain a virgin, there's, you know, guys are, are a, a part of that whole scene of uh, helping that happen or not. Not according to the church. Right. I was going to ask when purity culture is, you know, presented, what is the guy's role in it, if anything? Also to not have sex, but I feel like it is a lot more, the woman is the gatekeeper. So it's the woman's job to dress in a certain way and to make sure it's like that very kind of like Victorian era, sort of like it's the woman that's going to, that's going to make sure it doesn't happen. I feel like much more of that is put on the woman. I've talked to a few men that or that that have had, had been involved in the church or that had gone to church with us. And I'm like, what did you guys talk about at youth group? Because we would be sequestered as women and talk to to talk about sex and how we shouldn't have it. Men were definitely told never to masturbate. That was a huge no-no. Uh, women were never taught that because women don't do that, of course. So men were always talked about. That was always talked about with men. And then, yeah, they would have accountability groups. Yes, accountability groups. Why don't you talk about accountability groups, Sarah? I had an ex-boyfriend that if he had the desire to even masturbate, he would text his, he had a group of guy friends that were close Christian friends that he would text and they would, they would all like encourage him and tell him like which spoken word poetry to listen to and what to read and to get his mind off of wanting to masturbate, which is a very normal teenage boy, human desire right and you're you're taught that all of your desires are fleshly desires and and they're all bad really yeah everything that you're feeling is bad and sinful and so you're told never to trust your body i mean there's so many things we so many directions we can really go in and how purity culture just starts to permeate other parts of our development and then it gets into things like like rape culture too right like the you know the cuz if you are raised thinking the way i wear the things i do that, you know, that's my fault if something happens. And so like, actually, when I was a teenager, I was sexually assaulted. And when I went to my pastor, he said, you need to like, that's awful what happened, but you need to ask for forgiveness because you were drinking. So you put yourself in that situation. And I carried that with me for years. And that's, I think, part of the reason why it was hard for me to realize that I was gay because I had, you know, the post-traumatic stress of that and also all of the guilt tied up in the fact that I felt like somehow it was my fault what someone else had done. Well, I was going to just say, um, I, I pivot a little bit and just say another part of purity culture for men is the umbrella of authority that gets talked about a lot, how men are the head of the household. And I just wanted to mention that that they definitely, maybe they're not taught that their virginity is sacred, but they're taught that they have to protect and take care of their women and children and all their all of their wa children and wives' sin is on them. And that's a huge responsibility to put on young men. And so they're definitely, they. it's not only women that are being, or young women that are being affected by this. It's bad for everyone, this system. Right. Very bad. Right. And, and to know that if you are victimized, you need to look inward. Um, that, that happens in so many cultures and also a lot of fundamentalist branches of every religion, I think. Luckily, our court system in its infancy of understanding about this has started to shift and doesn't ask you if you've been drinking and doesn't ask you what you were wearing. 
because none of that matters. Because if you were, you know, running down the street naked and drunk and telling people to do things to you, if they did do them to you, it would be illegal for them. Um, so you can be in a, in a very compromised situation, very vulnerable, and it's still not okay for someone to violate you. Uh, but yes, the, it's brand new in its thinking around this and still does not translate to some states and doesn't translate to some countries. Um, I'm wondering about just, I know, so there's so much overlap with your experiences, um, but there's also this sort of separate part of your lives that I want to be able to get into a bit. And so, you know, Jess, I know you felt like you ran through your story quickly in your intro. I'm sure there's a lot more there that's also prompted you to want to to do this, to want to come forward and to want to have a show. So, so tell us a little bit about your upbringing and what are some of the things that became the motivator later on for you to say, you know what, I think I need to teach people about this. Well, maybe I'll start by saying that I am a cult enthusiast. Uh, I w- I can't say cult expert because you are, a cult, you know, I know what a cult expert is. I've been following the Indoctrination podcast for about a year and a half, and following your work and 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 the Stephen Hassan's podcast and books and you know researching Nexium and all of the cults. It's it's a bit of an obsession. So it is an outlet for me as well with my obsession to do this. I don't know why I'm so obsessed with cults, but I think that it it was just really interesting because the way that this podcast actually started was about, it's actually just over a year ago. Sarah was visiting me. We live on opposite sides of the country now. And we were watching the documentary about the Hillsong Church. And we hadn't talked about Christianity in years, Sarah and I. We really hadn't, you know... <sighs> other things are going on in our lives. You know, we're, we've been out of that for a really long time. And even when we were younger, we were living together when Sarah was going through her deconstruction. And we didn't even really talk about it then because it was just like, we didn't really know what was going on. This stuff wasn't really talked about. The dismantling of the patriarchy wasn't being talked about, just all of those things. And so we were watching the documentary about the Hillsong Church on Discovery Plus, And we were, uh, we were pausing it every two to five minutes to say, oh my gosh, you remember when this happened? Oh, I knew someone just like this. And then my husband was getting so annoyed because he was watching it with us. And so he just had to leave the room because he was like, you guys have the weirdest stories. What What is happening? Like he had no idea. When I used to tell people that I went to, ch- I used to just be like, oh, I was religious in high school. And that would be the end of the conversation. And then as we started talking, I realized how messed up so many of the things that we were taught are. And then I started to realize, oh, look at all of the issues I have because of this. And it's something that it has opened a door in my memory that I would like to remain closed, but I don't think it's good to remain closed. And I think that the reason why I really felt passionate about doing this in the end was that I look at my younger self and I just wish I could shake her and scream at her and, you know, in a loving way and just say like, what you're being taught is not right. It is not right. These grownups, so-called grownups that are your youth leaders, they don't always have your best interest at heart. They certainly don't. There's countless stories about people being sexually assaulted by members of churches or leadership members. We came out relatively unscathed with that. We have some stories, but nothing nothing as bad as other people's. And, and even then, I have so much anger for young teenage girls that are still being taught this today. Nothing has changed. It's honestly gotten worse. They talk, you know, they talk about in the Dugger documentary, they talk about how the messaging is the same. It's in a new package. There's no difference. What we were taught about in purity culture, when we were teenagers, there's no difference from then and now. It's just in a new package. Now it's all over TikTok. It's all over Instagram. I have it in my algorithm. I watch it all the time and I hate it. But I ha- like for us, we just want to stay up to date on what's going on in the Christian world so we can really have an honest conversation on the podcast about what's going on. And we do want to like on the podcast, we want to like include all sides of the argument and the conversation. We don't want to be one-sided. We want it to be nuanced. So 
uh, so I think just the anger that I feel for my younger self and for other younger women that are being taught this and, and being taught that they are sinful and that their bodies are dirty. And I can just, I can see in my mind, the damage that is causing. It's just, it made me really passionate about it. And it's helped me heal too. You know, there's a lot of healing that has happened for Sarah and I during this. I think Sarah had to start going to therapy again because we're just like, we have a lot of stuff to work through that we haven't been working through. So that's a long answer, but I hope that... No, and I, I'm going to actually ask questions that are going to make it an even longer answer because I'm curious, <laughs> curious about some of the details. One of the things that happens a lot is that things come up in your life and then you realize you're not healed from something. And I urge people to not be upset by that, but rather to kind of be happy that they were informed that there was still a lot under there that they had just submerged but that was sort of bound to come back up at some point uh, as soon as there was a trigger point. And so it's good actually to address it when people get upset thinking they're quote unquote better and then suddenly are in a relationship and not feeling worthy of love or something like flashes in their mind and they're thinking, where did that thought come from? They're not good people and they're just, they don't deserve good things. Like, what? Well, okay. That felt really loud and clear. Where did that come from? So to to almost be able to say, you know, to thank to thank your psyche, to thank your mind for alerting you that this was still there and that it needs to be looked at, needs to be addressed. When you're talking about the after effects and the things in your mind that were still impacting you, do you feel comfortable talking about one or two of those things that really, you know, that really needed to be dealt with and talked about? So for me specifically, I think sex is the biggest trigger point for me. And it always has been. I've worked around it, but I haven't worked through it. It's like, um, I feel like I'm in a therapy session. Uh, <laughs> it's, 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 it's really, it's complicated. And it's something that I've had to work through. And the, the role that I play, oh, this is gonna, I mean, we're getting really into it, but the role I play in the bedroom with a partner is my pleasure is just as worthy as his pleasure. So I am straight and I'm married. And so, you know, you, you think that once you get married, the guilt about sex isn't going to go away, but it, it stays when I was much younger before, like, you know, I only got married a couple of years ago and I've had a few relationships before that. And I had vaginismus. Yeah. So I had that. It is a kind of a psychological disorder sometimes. So mine was psychological where just all of the muscles in my pelvis were just so tight. Like just, I, it was all psychological. And I worked through that by just like by sheer willpower. I never, I, you know, at the time it was like 2009, not really a lot of therapy being talked about back then as much. So just through like I, I I worked through that. I, I just shoved my way through it. <laughs> like I just was like, I'm not going to deal with why this is happening. I'm just going to make this go away. Then once that went away, I thought that I was fine and I'm not, I'm not fine. And I think that the reason I had it and, and was because I was taught my whole teenage life by youth pastors, not necessarily by my parents. My parents just kind of didn't talk about sex, but my youth pastors that all of the desires I were, was having were sinful. All, until until you're married, you, you know, never ever think about these things. It's all bad, and you better pray for forgiveness. And once you're married, then you have to give your body over to your husband. But you know, like they didn't, they weren't super intense about it. They were like, still, you know, it'll be great. And you know, women's pleasure was never discussed ever. It was all about the man's orgasm. <laughs> So that still affects me to this day. And it's something that is interesting because my husband's not religious, never been religious, has no idea, never has barely ever set foot in a church. And he's had to learn all of these things. And just as I have had to learn them. So I think that's where my biggest problem lies is just with these, I still feel guilty when I have sex and I am 32 years old and married. And so that I think is my biggest sticking point right now. Uh, and then, you know, as I was, uh, I've worked through a lot of issues already with just feel like without like self-worth, uh, a lot of anxiety, well, a lot of depression, a lot of feeling trapped. I felt very trapped for a long time in the church and just working through those things in my twenties was like the majority of my twenties was just working through all of that. 
So I hope that is enough. I hope that's enough issues to kind of talk about, but. <laughs> yeah. uh, right. I mean, to start with where you ended about the anxiety and the depression, it's, it's very common and it's very good to address that and to see where that's come from. I think also when you're thinking about things that are long lasting, like issues around feeling guilt, when you're having sex, it is good to address it. It is good to talk about it. And it's good to look at it in a new way, just as you were programmed to see it one way, you can reprogram your mind through repetition and through trusting your own thoughts as much as you were trusting the pastors and anyone else who talked to you before. That's a hard sell. Kind of when you're thinking of really listening to yourself, that's that's a harder sell. I do think that that while sex is supposed to be pleasurable, you know, I think that if you can just reduce it to just having it be um, a function, <laughs> a bodily function, but also that I think within the context of a church, there is so much that is prohibited and that they really want you to have control over your impulses. And you can feel like you're suddenly not when you're having sex or when you're, you know, thinking about pleasure that you're, that you've lost the sense of having control and taking control. My feeling is that it's the opposite. That if you are deciding to be with someone and only having them have access to you in this way, you have already taken your control back because you are saying who is allowed and when they are allowed and how often and you get to be the gatekeeper. And it is it would be good for you to, I think, if possible to see that, that that you are in the power position there. And it's nice, you know, if you want to share it, you can, but really ultimately you're in the power position if you're with someone who's not going to take advantage of your boundaries. And if you set them, then, you know, you're the one in charge. And, and so you have not made this sort of statement about yourself that you're willing to, you know, have sex with anyone or have anyone do anything to you. It sounds like you have been very clear, probably, in your process, and that's why you're feeling safe enough to do it at all, um, about what is okay and what's not okay. And that's really standing up tall in in your life and even in the bedroom. So there's nothing that you're doing wrong, but that you're engaging in something that they wanted you to be afraid of. Because I think drives in general are threatening to people who want control over you because they know how powerful they are. Absolutely. It's just like really interesting to think about it like that. <laughs> These are issues that I haven't quite worked through yet. So yeah, again, feel like I'm in a nice therapy session, which is probably very helpful for me. Thanks for listening, guys, uh, whoever's listening, but <laughs> this is my session. It's right. It's your it's your session. Although, you know, the people listening, many people listening are going to relate to this. And that's why I think it's good to kind of explore it for for your sake, but also for anyone hearing this. I think for me and for many people, maybe Sarah included, my pendulum swung the opposite way once I felt free. And I kind of just had sex with lots of people, which I, again, I don't regret. But sometimes I think that maybe I wasn't, I wasn't exerting my power in the right way. I thought I might, maybe at the time, that's what I needed. I needed to just do whatever I wanted, whenever I wanted in order to feel whole but looking back, I think the my motivations might have been maybe unhealthy, but you know, I ended up where I am and I'm ha- very happy about it. But I think with a lot of people that probably are listening, maybe maybe the the pendulum did swing the other way and we all we went through our 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 I don't know, slutty phase. Is that a good way to put it? <laughs> and uh, I say slutty in an endearing way. It's a great word. I love that word. <laughs> and uh, yeah, and I think that some people might come to regret that and I don't think that that's necessary. Uh, Sarah and I just kind of had a conversation about our number. You don't want your number to get too high. Yeah. And that was big for Sarah. Not as big for me. I almost was like, take, took it as a challenge to get it as high as possible. Like the reason that I took it as a challenge, because it was just such a F you to all the people that told me to never do that growing up. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So I I actually don't think that that shows um, bad judgment. I mean, I think it is exactly as you said, it is a pendulum swing and it is you enjoying your freedom. But just like with anything that's done in the extreme in either direction, 
you realize that it can have its pitfalls and that you want to find yourself somewhere back in the middle. But, you know, it happens from a very young age. I think about kids who are told, don't climb that ladder, don't get on the thing. And then they're like, mm, they just need to, you know, please. And a lot of parents, I think, mistakenly see that. Um, well, I mean, it could be that it's partly this. So I don't want to say it's a mistake. But I, I, I don't think that the child is testing the parent and and being disobedient in that moment, I think the child is testing themselves. You just said that I can't do that or that's dangerous. I'm going to see if I am actually able and capable, strong enough, um, if I can do the thing that you said I can't do because I might hurt myself. And if I can do it without hurting myself, I'm going to feel very cool about myself. And it feels more powerful to make your own limits instead of the limits that someone else prescribes for you. Exactly right. And then you see how it works for you. Like if a, if a child says, okay, you told me not to do that. I just did that. And now I'm bruised. Okay, now I, now I get it. I get, so I get, but I kind of had to see it for myself. I found that in college with kids who, I mean, I was the same age, but we I was raised with my parents, they did wine tasting. So among other things, just for fun, but so I could have a sip here and there. So when I got to college and people were drinking into oblivion, I wasn't because it wasn't this forbidden fruit and it wasn't the thing you weren't allowed to do. And so people were having their stomach pumped and I'm like, oh, okay, no, that's not, I don't have to see what, how much I can do, but I also don't, ha I didn't have to have that feeling of pushing out the walls, which is a very important thing to, to do in your life, to just push out the walls and see. And that's adolescent development anyway, in and of itself, right? It's pushing those limits. It's othering yourself from the way you were raised from your family system to try and forge your own path. Absolutely. So I think it's a natural response that's sometimes amplified when you're in one really intense environment and then you leave it and you, like Jessica said, the pendulum swings too far. Right. Definitely did some of that. <laughs> but yeah, I think that the learning curve is important as long as what happens in the learning curve is you say, oh, I got it. Oh, now I got it. Or I'm I'm with a lot of different partners and I'm not feeling great in the morning and I don't, I really actually want to connect with one person. And then you learn from that you know, but you also learn that you're, you're not a bad person. You're just not that person. And so, okay. So Sarah, let's switch over to you. Tell us a little bit about some of the things that, that you were left with that were the impetus for you wanting to also get the message out about this. For me, a lot of it had to do with, like, it was exactly what you said, being told not to do something and then going and doing it. I feel like that was a lot of my life. Like I remember at age 12 reading in the Bible that it said that men are the head of women. And then, you know, being, being told like, well, women aren't allowed to be deacons at the church. And I was like, well, I'm going to make a petition and I'm going to find a, a case for scripture that, you know, Phoebe, the deaconess, like I could still go through all those arguments in my head down so many different rabbit holes I went down. For me, because I've been raised in Christianity, I was operating for so long within that worldview. And so it was really me trying to find the biblical interpretation that matched what I felt intrinsically was right, like gender equality. And so there, you know, I could tell you all kinds of different organizations to do with gender equality. And I think I never, I never really felt like going outside of the Christian worldview. I never felt like that was possible. It just seemed like this thing that I would never do. I couldn't imagine a life where like Jesus wasn't my, my, my person, my God, my, you know, my personal relationship with this Lord and savior. It was so deep. And that was, you know, I prayed all the time. I read my Bible all the time. That was so central to me. And then even when I went to the party school and quote unquote backslid, I had so much guilt and I just felt like a hot mess. Cause you know, I would go to church on Sunday and I'd be bawling at the altar. And then, then I'd, you know, I'd go and I'd be, be smoking weed and I'd be reading Richard Dawkins and Christopher Hitchens. And, and I just was all over the map and it was so hard to separate what was true and what was not true. And I felt like I lost my faith bit by bit. But I didn't, I didn't really feel like I had community in that because when you're raised in an environment where your entire family, extended family, all of your friends are within one, one system of belief, you lose a lot. You risk a lot when you, when you leave. 
And so when I came out as non-Christian to the people in my life that were Christian, I actually lost more people in my life when I came out as non-Christian than when I came out as gay. And that was actually a harder for me coming out as not a Christian was actually harder than coming out as queer. And probably because I was, I was younger, I was 21 versus like 29. So that makes, that makes a big difference in development, self-confidence, um, life experience. But it, for me, that was really hard. And I had so much anger against I, what I felt was just, I felt like it's right in people's faces. And I was like, how do people not see how awful this is, how horrible it is to, you know, base your entire system on human sacrifice, that humans are so evil and that God can't just forgive them. And he's sending his son. Like it, to me, once I was outside of it, I was like, how did I ever, how did I ever make sense of any of this? And I think I went to the extreme where I really wanted people to deconvert. And I, and I felt like, you know, people being within Christianity was, was super harmful, but then over the experience of doing the podcast and even just the last few years of having the pendulum swing more back to the center, I realized that, you know, there's a lot of ways to be and to make sense of the world as a human being. And that there, you know, there are people that I love and I'm so close with that they do that within the framework of Christianity and that we don't have to agree on everything. But the kind of, you know, the kind of world, the kind of country, the kind of community I want to live in is one where we can respectfully coexist, but I have no problem calling things out. Like, you know, like I just had the other day, someone like distant family member commenting on one of my Facebook statuses about, you know, how it's a sin for people to be homosexual and how they will not enter the kingdom of heaven. And, and for me, I I get really anxious. And then I'm like, no, you know what? All I can do is, is send back love, say, I don't agree with you, but like I'm sending love because I'm not going to convince this person. And all the time and energy I spent when I had first left Christianity trying to convince other people, it's just that it's not going to work. The biggest learning experience of this podcast has been, you know, just accepting the differences and figuring out what are the lines I draw in my, in the sand and realizing that relationships that you have with other people aren't an all or nothing. I went to therapy um, since starting the podcast because a lot of things were coming up. And one of the analogies my therapist made that I really liked was like, you're, you can picture your life or like who you are as, as a house. And maybe there are some people that, you know, you have a relationship with them, but you'll just, you'll just chat with them at the door or they'll come into your entryway, but you're not inviting them in into the living room. And they're definitely not coming up to your bedroom. They're not seeing your mess. They're not you're not letting them into all of those parts that are not safe and it's okay. So relationships don't have to be an all or nothing. You have the right to set boundaries. And that's something that I really, really struggled with within Christianity because, you know, my, my sin, my inner world, my inner thoughts were expected to be confessed and out there because in the church, I went to the New Frontiers one. Once you were really into the church, you had spiritual mentors that were assigned to you and you were expected to talk about all the sins that you were struggling with, whether they were just in your mind or they were something that you were acting out. So I feel like that made it really hard to have a sense of boundaries and how it, it's so enmeshed. Like if you think of the concept, like you don't know where you end versus where someone else starts. And that's been a lot of on learning for me personally. Wow. It's very powerful. And I, I think also about the comment that you're saying that you got about that you're not going to go to heaven and the way you responded. There is this selective fundamentalism, I think, when it comes to the Bible, um, because people are going to throw at you what they think um, really is going to be the biggest slight to you and has the most bias that concurs with their bias. And I know the biblical arguments for homosexual being accepted and getting into the Greek words, but that's not going to work with this person here. We could fight all day on comment sections. Yeah, I could debate using the Bible. I probably know it better than that person does. Or do you wear mi- mixed fabrics? Like no cotton spandex blends. Right? Yeah. Because they're, you know, then, in, oh, it's okay to own slaves or it's okay if you rape a woman as long as you marry her. You know, there are other... Oh, mixed, yes, right. Mixed fabrics. That is a thing. 
Yeah, no, I know that's a that's definitely a thing. I know the Hebrew word for that. It it is something within orthodoxy that they you know still think about and care about. And I don't know if people even who follow it know where it originated. Which is also the thing about so many things being talked about in the Bible that were not in line with what is known today, and, and there just wasn't an awareness of the science of it all. But you're right. Rebutting is is going to just be like banging your head against the wall. And you can think you have a perfectly crafted response and it just doesn't matter at all. And I'm sure that's very frustrating. So I'm curious about other responses that you've gotten that may not have been great and, uh, and how you've handled that. Do you have like... 24 hours straight. Yeah. <laughs> we have, we're pretty active on our social media. And so we get a lot of responses from a lot of people across the world. And most, you know, even yesterday, the day, you know, we, we have a lot of people DMing us saying that they're going to pray for us. And we have different approaches, don't we, Jessica? So Sarah deals with the DMs because I have a lot of anger. Uh, I just find it, I find it patronizing, but what Sarah said earlier and what I have also learned is that it is to be respectful of people's beliefs. And I have lots of friends that are that are Christians and they're wonderful people. And that doesn't affect our friendship. The people that are reaching out to us telling us we're going to go to hell, they're not, there's just no getting through to that. You just have to ignore it because if you respond, which we have done, it's going to send you down a spiraling you know, a, an anxiety spiral that you're not going to be able to get out of for a few hours. It's not productive and it sucks a lot of energy. I mean, I, I believe in honest dialogue and I think that we, I mean, we've had a few Christians that we've interviewed on our podcast that we don't agree on everything, but you know, we have that common ground and we want to lift up those voices where we're like, we really like what you're doing, even if you're operating within a different worldview. But yeah, people in the DMs, it's usually just, you know, it's not going to be productive unless you actually take the time to. Yeah. And and, and it's, it, you know, when they reach out, when people reach out to us, in my mind, I'm like, well, they, they have one goal in mind, pers- in my opinion, and they're trying to convert us. And Sarah has a lot more patience for that. And I think what we want to show people and what Sarah is really good at showing people is that atheists or agnostic atheists or whatever you want to call us, if you really feel like you need to label us, which I don't really think it matters. But if you feel like you need to label us, we're not bad people and we're nice people. And there's a lot of people that reach out to us that I know that they've probably never had a conversation with somebody that's outside of their worldview. So we try to be as kind as possible so that if they ever even have a little doubt or they think that they want to be a little more progressive in their faith, then they know that it is a safe place to do it, that there's good people out there. Because I think that the church demonizes outsiders so much. And every single day is a battle of us, me trying to remember, like, don't other people. Don't other people. We know the rhetoric is feeding. I'm like, it's probably somewhat guilt too, because I'm like, oh, like they they think that I'm, you know, I'm going to be bad. I'm going to be, you know, evil and selfish. And all those things I was told that, you were if you weren't a Christian or if you were, you know, quote unquote, living for yourself and not living for God. Those are things I like, I don't want to be like, I think those are big fears I have. Like, I don't want to be perceived as selfish, whether that's right or wrong. I think there's so many things that are just so deeply ingrained. So I'm like, all right, I'm going to try and act completely opposite to that and, you know, try and show love because they don't think I can love if I don't have God. Yeah. It's a work in progress for both of us. And we come, we come at it from different different motivations where yeah sarah's you're motivated i'm motivated by anger (laughs) oh i'm angry i'm angry about some things i'm very angry about some things it's really tough and the it could because it's pride month while we're recording this there's been a lot of we have posted a lot of pride related posts and that is inviting a lot of let's just say dialogue and it's been it's been tough and probably very triggering for sarah i'm assuming it, yeah. And I do want to hear about it. It's, you know, I know someone, uh, a friend of mine has a store on, uh, where he advertises a lot on Facebook and he did a lot for Pride Month and sweatshirts and, you know, mugs and a lot of things. The amount of vitriol and Bible quoting was astounding and still is. It's ongoing. And what's been interesting is that the people responding have then started fighting with each other. Oh my God. Don't <laughs> get me started. 
Oh, uh, but we have some great, we have some great like listeners that are dedicated that like go to bat in our comments. Shout out to Jameson. We have a couple people that they they message us and they're like, sorry, if I'm like overwhelming your comments, we're like, you know, I don't have the energy to fight. And it's nice that somebody's fighting for us. Just sometimes I had a, a video on Instagram. Get What did it end up at? Nine million views. And the in the th- infighting in the comments was, I mean, I had to delete Instagram for a few days just because like I couldn't take the notifications. Like it was, oh, it immediately go. It immediately goes to somehow it all, all goes to trans people and yeah. And my video had nothing to do with trans. It was just a joke, and it's immediately anti-trans. Not not that our thing was anti-trans. The comments are very much like, you know, well. If a girl can't get married at 18, why can you let kids cut off their genitals? Just like zero to a hundred. Blatantly untrue, on misinformed. It's a lot, it's a lot of um black and white thinking. We're trying, so it's anyway, we're constantly just trying to be more nuanced in literally everything we do. And it's it's a battle, but it's constant. And I I, I feel like everyone has should have to do this. But I'm angry. I'm angry about all of the like where it's Pride Month. There are a lot of bills in the United States right now that are anti-LGBTQIA. And we're seeing that trickle up into Canada right now. Like the province I live in, they just had a review and redid their sexual orientation and gender identity policy. And it's actually regressed now. Teachers are not allowed to call children by their chosen name or pronouns in class even without the parents' consent if the children are under 16. So children are like essentially being forced to be outed to their parents when like a lot, you know, a lot of these children potentially are in homes where they would be unsafe. And this isn't even official documents. This is just like name use. And it's like, okay, Jessica is named Jessica. She could have been called Jess by a teacher and you didn't need to ask for permission. It's just so... Yeah, it's been, there's been a lot. (laughs) We've been dealing with a lot, you know, we've been doing the podcast since September. Uh, so it's been almost a year. And uh, since the first episode to now, my life has dramatically shifted. My view, worldview has dramatically shifted to hopefully be more inclusive. Well, uh, yeah, I mean, I think I was inclusive to begin with, but I think now I, ha- I have a, a deeper understanding of human nature that I didn't expect to ever have. And a lot like very gray, like my whole life is just a gray area, I feel like sometimes. So, right. You know, seeing also the trends and having to deal with the trends and having to deal with what really frightens a lot of people, and for good reason, just trends towards more religiosity and fewer rights for women. And then moving into stripping people of their rights if they're gay and lesbian, trans, it, it is. It is so frightening. And what it does, it's interesting when people fight, like whenever I get backlash or when I say something, like having being the mom of a trans kid and I'm fine with it, like somehow I'm not supposed to be, according to some of the listeners of the podcast. Um, and it's a it's a failure on my part as a parent. But it's so not a thing. Uh, and it really doesn't have to be a thing because if you make it a thing, then you are you are really pushing your child into a place where they can have a lot of mental health issues because of you, <laughs> not because they're trans or because of a church, but not because they're trans. On the one hand, while all of this is happening, that can feel like things are are going south. There is also a lot of awareness and tolerance. I, I don't really like the word tolerance because it shouldn't be that you just tolerate people, but still, I understand the point of it. But just this awareness and wanting to be open, which is a good thing. So I I toggle between being depressed about it, but also being uplifted by the fact that some people are really trying and and they're able to see things in a new way. But I'm wondering, going back to Sarah, when you were talking about the anger that you are feeling, is it because of particular kind of moments that you're remembering or dictates that you had to follow? What triggers it? I think sometimes it's other people's tolerance of intolerance, like saying, oh, well, they're old or they're a different generation or like they just don't get it, but whatever. I think people don't realize like how hard it is if you're like the life, the very life that you're living, the, you know, like I have like my partner and I love her and we have a great relationship. And just to think that so many people in the world and, you know, people that I love even think that 
that it's wrong and that it's awful and it's worthy of burning in hell for. I think the more that I let myself go down that rabbit hole, the more angry I get. Like I was listening to, cause I'm, I'm interested of the experience, like the current state of Christianity. Cause I know quite a few people that are Christians that are queer affirming. And I do think that has been a major shift within the millennial generation. And I, so there's, there's one artist I've been listening to on re- repeat their name. They're called Semler and they, they toured for Reliant K, but they have this song that just came out called faith. And it's like in the, it's getting up to the top 10 of the Christian billboards. And it's about their sexuality and about like how God accepts them. And, and I just love it. And it's so healing to see, even though I'm not a Christian to see those people and those voices within Christianity. Cause I think it's so important that people, I did, I left the faith for different reasons other than sexuality. And I think it's so important though, that if someone is LGBT that, and their faith is important to them, that they don't feel like it's a false dichotomy and they have to choose. So I think that's really healing, but then I'll go down the other opposite ends of things. Like I, I sent Jessica a screenshot. There's this organization that, that stems out of new frontiers and it's called living out. And they have like a rainbow as part of their logo, but they believe that all gay people should be celibate. And they were referring to gay married couples as what did they call it? They called it a quasi marital sexual relationship. Uh, <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. I can't. I, Sarah sends me these things all the time. I'm like, what are you up to over there? <laughs> <laughs> they make me mad. And and it's it's just like conversion therapy rebranded, right? It's like, okay, we're not going to try and make you straight, but now you have to be celibate. So I don't know that it's really it's really any better. We're like, oh, we know we can't change it from the science, but let's just, you know, let's just not give you the option to be in a quasi-marital sexual relationship. <laughs> I can't do it. And convince, and it convinces people that they're okay with it, even though perhaps they aren't deep down and they're just burying their true feelings. And I mean, I can't speak for people that are part of this organization and say that, oh, what you know, you're not okay with actually being celibate. Maybe they are, but. And they have the right to do that. Yeah, of course. But it's, uh, it's, it can be a lot more damaging than helpful. That's for sure. Oh yeah. And I, and I think it also keeps the focus in the wrong places. So you get lost in the weeds with things like this, where someone is defining your relationship and someone is defining what kind of marriage you have. And if it's quasi, if it's real, if it's whatever else. And uh, what I would love instead is for there to be a zooming out and to not get caught in the weeds and to see are the people who we talk to in this way and think about in this way, are they suffering because of it? Are we, are we making people unhappy? Are we having people leave the fold if we care about this because of how we're treating them? I mean, these are, I think, the bigger questions. But I'm wondering just, you know, from doing the podcast, I mean, here, being able to have a, a forum where you can get out some of your anger and you can also you know, deal with some of the sadness is a really, really powerful thing. I'm sure also you've gotten some incredible feedback where it has been life affirming and changing and, you know, for, for a lot of people, which is really very powerful. And, and for, I think for both of you during times where you were struggling, it would have been so nice for you to have a voice to listen to for people who could say what you're going through is natural and normal and you're not a bad person and it's all okay and et cetera, et cetera. But, you know, that that wasn't available to most people. And also most people were sort of raised to not go on the internet and not listen to podcasts and not listen to, you know, heretic messages. So I'm sure that you are transforming a lot of lives, but also helping people not feel alone, um, which is also some of the other comments you've probably received that will hopefully stay with you. Yeah, the negative ones t- tend to stick out, don't they? There's such a negativity bias as human beings. Right, yeah, it's true. Yeah, we absolutely get some people reaching out to us, which has been nice. Um, and, and and people DMing us. And we and we always love the good DMs. And it is it is encouraging because we have been getting more listeners as time goes on. It has been growing. And it is, it's just, it's fun to build that little community. It makes you, it makes me, I, I don't know about you, Sarah, but I feel very empowered and that how we were kind of raised in the church to be quiet women and 
it feels really empowering to not be a quiet woman because I've never actually been a quiet woman. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> is that is that shocking to anybody? Um, but no, I mean, and that's that's you know, was part of my depression within the church is that I couldn't be authentic in any way whatsoever. And first, and also knowing that there's so many people out there with stories like ours, it's simultaneously sad, but also very, it it makes us realize what we're doing is the right thing to do. Because I think, I don't know about you, Sarah, I, I feel like we doubt ourselves a lot. We want to make sure we say the right thing and do the right things and, and always. And that it's perceived in the right way. Like we don't want people to perceive that we are bashing the entire religion of Christianity because it's so it's so broad and we're not bashing anyone. We're just talking about our experiences. We're looking at things that are within the church now and historically, and we're providing our own opinions and comments on them, which I think every human has the right to do, but we're trying to do it in a hopefully respectful way. But it has been really validating. In particular, we did an episode on the New Frontiers Church where I I wasn't, you know, I was told I wasn't allowed to leave the United Kingdom. All the elder, the male elders sat me down and said, you can't leave. It's God's will for you to stay for this one Christian conference. And then I had to get some people in my support system to come help me leave. And so that experience in particular, I feel like that organization, like I, there, you can find random forums where people are talking about it being cult-like, but generally there's not a lot out there. I think we're the first podcast episode and we had people that, just coming out of the woodworks, random people from that church or who had been involved in that church being like, thank you for doing this episode. Like that was really validating my experience. That really resonated with me. That captured what I went through and I've never heard anyone else talk about it. So I think that was really powerful for me being able to be like, this is, you know, this is what we went through and putting it out there. The Duggar documentary, and I keep coming back to this because it's it's really kind of in the zeitgeist right now, but they they put it in such a nice packet, you know, neat package tra- talking about the I oh gosh, what's it called? I F I L P S I it's the acronyms. I can't ever get them, but talking about that particular denomination. And then now everyone's like, okay, well, this is this is probably a cult. This is very cult-like, at least. And there are thousands, hundreds, maybe thousands of denominations of Christianity that are exactly like that, but they just don't have an Amazon or a Netflix documentary yet. Like, I think that people need to be aware of that, that this is not the only one. This is one of so many. And just because there isn't a documentary about it doesn't mean it's, you know, it's not, you know, a cult. So if somebody made a documentary about the New Frontiers Church, I think it'd be pretty damning. Yeah. And even contrasting experiences in the Baptist Church versus the New Frontiers Church. Like you can have, you can be within Christianity and have very different experiences. And some, you know, some churches are much more healthy in terms of power balance and you just aren't seeing people's lives impacted the same way. Right. It's so, it's so incredible. And I think just as we're, we're finishing up, you know, yes, there does need to be a light that is shined on a lot of different groups. And you have the ability to do that with your show, which is very powerful. And that maybe it will be the thing that ignites interest even in filmmakers to want to do something about the this church or these churches that you talk about. What's also true, because I've, I've learned this, you know, there, there are so many things that you might hear that um, where people are being critical or, you know, I think about Sarah, you talking about, you know, being more rejected communally by saying you weren't Christian rather than saying that you're gay. I mean, there there's so much ostracizing and sequestering, pushing people to the side. And you can feel sometimes more so when you're getting attacked. Like here, I'm sort of, I'm in this little corner again and people are, you know, upset with me. What I have learned, and not that you necessarily needed this because I don't think it depresses you, but it's just a good frame of reference that there are people who were talked to who who are really involved in social media, but in terms of, you know, spewing a lot of hate. And they were asked about why they do it. And for some, it helps them feel good, feel a release, feel powerful in this world, helps them have a voice. And so they're using that for themselves. And and then what that means is that it really doesn't have anything to do with you, which is always nice to know um, because you didn't hurt them. You were just saying something and they're saying something else. But also that it's like a hundred to one split in terms of 
how people often make comments. They'll go to the effort of making a comment that's negative when they have something they want to say, or it comes out of their fear, or it comes out of them just not being ready to look at it yet. I like the word yet when I think about people and feeling, uh, seeing them stuck somewhere, or that they have to prove something to the people in their life that they believe this way. And they're using that forum to be vocal so that their pastor or family, whoever will be happy with them. So again, it's about them and them getting their needs met. But the split is often that if people are happy, they don't write in oftentimes. And they, it's the ones who are unhappy or have a cross to bear, pardon the expression. Um, it, it's like um, people who will be lined up in a store um, because they're going to customer service. I doubt that the people there are waiting in line to be able to say, I love your sweaters this season. <laughs> so it's like, I'm going to wait to complain and I'm going to wait online to complain because it feels good and I need to complain. So you're going to hear more of the negative than the positive and there's much more positive out there and they're just not in touch. They just let you know that they like it by listening. So just so you know, so it doesn't feel uneven or feel like it's all this negative stuff. It's really not. It's a tiny percentage. So it was wonderful to talk to both of you and to hear from you and and what you've been through. And I know there's a lot more there. And I know we'll be talking also on your show, which will be very exciting. I am happy to get to know you and for people to get to know you. Where can the listeners find you and your show? So you can find You Can't Get to Heaven in a Miniskirt podcast wherever you get your podcasts. We're also on Instagram at Heaven in a Miniskirt, as well as TikTok at Heaven in a Miniskirt. And you can go on to heaveninaminiskirt.com where you'll really just find odd links to all of our stuff. Okay. I love that. And I love that it's called Heaven in a Miniskirt, which means you got there. Look. Exactly. We're in heaven with Miniskirt. Yeah. <laughs> right on. Uh Okay, good. Thank you to both of you, really. It's been a pleasure. Thank you so much for having us. Thank you. One more thing before you go. It was so nice to be able to talk to Jess and Sarah. And again, go to check out their podcast to hear the other part of our conversation together. It is really incredible how many times I hear people talking about how because they were raised in a very strict religious environment, they are suffering from anxiety and they're suffering from depression, and they're suffering from feeling this sort of leftover burden of feeling guilty, and feeling guilty about doing things or thinking things or just having desires and drives that are natural. It is so damaging to tell someone that what they're feeling is unnatural, what they're feeling is evil when what they're feeling is a natural variation of the human spectrum of emotion, all of the different emotions that people feel for a reason, that we're given to be able to feel for a reason, for evolutionary processes, for survival, for connection, for understanding what's happening around us. And if it feels right, if it doesn't, it's a way we get a read on if something is okay or not. If you have an environment around you that just tells you that any sexual drive or anything, a feeling of jealousy, etc., is evil, then what are you supposed to feel about yourself when you know that's sort of naturally part of who you are? So then you are in part evil? It is so damaging. It's so unfair. And it's so wrong to pathologize things that are absolutely normal. One of the things that they talked about was this idea that all desires were bad and that when you got married, you gave your body over to your husband. And so again, time and time again, 
I hear while there are some boys and some men clearly who are given also unfair burdens and are pathologized for being very normal and feeling very normal things or wanting very normal things, it is most often the girls and the women who are given many more rules, many more guidelines that are unrealistic, many more bits of structure around them with many more punishments. And not only the punishment that's going to come to you, but what God is going to do to you if you just do what is natural to you. And also the punishment somehow that the group is going to give you, the public shaming, the fact that you're going to be ostracized, that you're going to be called something and seen that way forever. It is so difficult to be able just to be in these environments and to feel okay about yourself. I think about the song that they reference that is part of the reason that the title of their podcast is that that you can't get into heaven in a miniskirt. And I know we talked a little bit about it during our conversation, but one of the things that I notice is that when there is some sort of a rule like that about what you're allowed to do, what you're not allowed to do to get into heaven, there are many more placed on the girls and the women than on the boys and the men. That's not to exclude, again, the boys and the men who have to deal with some incredibly unfair rules as well. But I think about how it highlights what matters more than other things. When you have a song like that, when you have lyrics like that, when you have an idea like that, and you end up talking about things like clothing, I would love it if there is this structure that is being taught within a group that there is a God and that there's a devil and that there is heaven and there is hell, which is something some people believe in and some people don't. But regardless, just keeping with this argument here, if you believe that God is going to judge you based on what you do, and then decide if you deserve to be rewarded by being led into heaven or not. I would hope that God, a spiritual being, something that is supposed to be above mm, just kind of everyday ways of thinking, who looks at loftier things, who looks at things that maybe should matter more, that the words of the song, the lyrics could be something more like, you can't get to heaven if you abuse people. You can't get to heaven if you neglect children. You can't get to heaven if you decide that someone, a particular gender, does not have any control over their body and no does not mean no. And you can't get to heaven, really, if you're going to spend your day judging people based on the length of their skirt more so than their ethics, their values, their morals. I wish there were more teachings like that. I feel like that matters so much more. Thank you again to Jess and to Sarah and to all the work they're doing and all the educating they're doing. I wish them well. And I will talk to you all next week. Thank you very much for listening. Please support Indoctrination on Patreon at patreon.com slash indoctrination. Be sure to give us a follow on our social media. Find us on Facebook and Instagram using at Indoctrination Podcast. And for Twitter, find us at at underscore indoctrination. We love hearing from you too. So send us an email at indoctrinationshow at gmail.com. And for more updates on the show, visit our website at www.podpage.com forward slash indoctrination.